The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. Today I want to tackle a very critical topic, um, the topic that everybody asks and nobody knows the answer for, and perhaps you'll end up with more questions than answers at the end of the sermon, but when God remains silent, that's the topic, when God remains silent. The secular world asks you and I who believe in Jesus Christ If there is a God, why does he remain silent? When you see the endless slaughter of the innocent people, when you see the endless turmoil that you see around the world among the innocents, and when you see that the evil is triumphant all over the world, how can you call God just and loving creator? When train loads upon train loads of people are taken to Auschwitz camp and murdered systematically, forget about Auschwitz, what about the gulags in Russia, the prison camps, or Khmer Rouge systematically slaughtered 1.7 million Cambodians, or the Armenian genocide that happened, or the Rwandan genocide happened, or the South Sudan and the Darfur incident or the Middle East crisis that is going on right now, where is God and why does he remain silent in the face of tragedy, in the face of injustice perpetrated by these evil men? Where is God and why does he remain silent? Let's let's take it down to a personal level. We look at the national calamities, we look at all those things, that's one thing. But where is God when you yourself are hurting somewhere in a corner? Where is God when you faced a crisis in your life where you lost somebody so precious that you didn't expect a premature death or unforeseen circumstance where you lost your job or your health? Where was God When bad things were happening to you, where is God when you were suffering? Where is God when an innocent person is murdered or raped or abused? Why does God remain silent? Because of the lack of answers for this question, people nowadays are looking to self for the answers. They're looking to something called the humanism, where man is dependent upon his philosophy, his ideology, his rules. There's more faith in the rule of man, or there's more faith in the power and the belief in what we can accomplish together. That's the talk that exists in the world today in many shapes and forms. Seems like God and his moral code have been outdated, and people would not even consider them to be true because... He is silent. We are the masters of our own fate. We determine our own destiny. These are the times that we are living in. So how do we answer this question? Is this a valid question, ladies and gentlemen? Is this a valid question, brothers and sisters in Christ? It is, isn't it? In a world where God intervened, In a world where God steps into a circumstance and destroys the choice of an individual, that world is rendered meaningless and that world will go against the nature of God. Let me explain. Somebody points a gun at somebody and is ready to shoot them. God steps into the scenario God takes that gun and he twists it, or he stops that bullet in a miraculous way and that prevents the guy from hitting, all of a sudden, we have to ask God, 
what about my free will what about my choice what about my freedom you see god is not the one who perpetrates these incidents and remains silent there is something called the free will and the choice that god has endowed each and every human being on this planet with you can choose to love your neighbor or you can choose to hurt him you can choose to make people's lives better to being kind and sincere towards others or you can choose to destroy by living selfish lives there is a choice that god has given mankind and he gives you the choice to serve him and obey him out of love deuteronomy says in chapter 30 verse 19 and 20 God comes down upon Mount Sinai and he's talking to the Israelites and this is what he says This day I call upon the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death blessings and curses Now choose life so that you and your children may live that you may love the Lord your God listen to his voice hold fast to him for the Lord is your life He will give you many years in the land he swore to the to your fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. God came down upon Mount Sinai and he was not talking to angels. He was not talking to ro- robots or machines. He was talking to people, real people, giving them real choices. explaining to them the real consequence consequences that flow out of their choices that is the goodness of god the goodness of god gives choice to a man if he is a dictator he wouldn't have given you a choice and wouldn't have given me a choice or he would have forced and inbuilt you to love him mandatorily like a dictator but god is a gracious and a compassionate god who is bent upon giving you that choice hoping that you would make the right one so majority of the tragedies that you see in this world are not because of god being silent they are the consequence of the greed of man because he's very self-centered the world in which we live man himself tends to be god he tends him he seems to be the one who dictates what is right and what is wrong he is the one who determines what is evil and spurred on by this factor called satan god's enemy who's bent upon stealing killing and destroying humanity he continues to make these choices that destroy the lives of men the choices influenced by the evil one so coming back to this question it is not god who failed during the holocaust it is not god who failed in the gulags it is not god who failed during rwanda or the restlessness that is there in the middle east today it is not god who failed and allowed man to do barbaric things but is god the better way to look at it is, is it is god who is patient with mankind allowing them to make their choices hopefully so that they can turn from the wicked ways that is why god is silent if is if god himself doesn't care for humanity ladies and gentlemen how could he tell us to say if somebody slaps you on one cheek show the other one if a god if god doesn't care about humanity why would he give us something called the 10 commandments where he tells us not to steal not to murder not to covet this is a god who cares so that you don't make those wrong choices but most importantly this is the case that argues the fact that god cares for humanity and god loves humanity the answer is the cross itself if god is indifferent to humans if god is indifferent to injustice why would he send his only begotten son to die for the sins while we were yet sinners god died for the ungodly and that shows that this god loves and cares for humanity and if this doesn't convince you i'll show you one scripture 
One scripture probably among many in the scriptures that you can be convinced that God cares. This is what he tells Israel. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from his way and uh, uh, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Isn't that clear enough? God gives you a choice. God gives us a choice. And God is waiting for the humanity in this world to make that choice so that we can turn from our wicked ways and turn to our living God and find hope and salvation. That is why God is silent. Not because he's inconsiderate or indifferent. God is silent because he cares that none should perish. Moving on, the question now becomes, why is God silent in the life of believers? The unsaved world, sure, we can kind of explain that first part, but what about you and I? We are troubled, so we pray. We are distressed, so we cry out to God. The reason why we cry out to God is that God would intervene as soon as possible and fix our problem. But the reply you get from God is silence and it doesn't make sense. This silence is so deafening sometimes that you lose that hope, that small glimmer of hope, and you wonder whether God actually listened to your cry. You wonder whether God cares for you. Don't you think ever in your life, in your Christian life, you're exclusive in your suffering or exclusive in experiencing the silence of God. There are many saints of God who have been through this situation before. Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote in his autobiography and he says this, He who now feebly expounds these words knows within himself more than he would care or dare to tell of these abysses of the inward anguish. He has sailed around the cape of the storms and has drifted along by the dreary headlands of despair. Charles Spurgeon suffered from depression. Charles Spurgeon, a mighty man of God, the prince of preachers, experienced the silence of God. C.S. Lewis, another man, his wife died of cancer. And when his wife died of cancer, he called to God for comfort, and he sensed no reply. And this is what C.S. Lewis said. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in the time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? When things are going good, it seems like God is present. When things are going crazily bad, Seems like God is absent. Is Charles Spurgeon and C.S. Lewis the only people who went through this? If you look at the scriptures, this pattern of God's silence exists everywhere. You look at Job. Job says, I cry to you for help. You do not answer me. I stand and you only look at me. Imagine that statement. King David, how many times he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Psalm 77, verse 79. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never be favorable again? Has his loving kindness ceased forever? Has his promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or he has, he has, has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? This is in your very Bible that you're reading, ladies and gentlemen. 83, Psalm 83, verse 1. Oh God, do not, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent. And oh God, do not be still. Literally, these people... In the scriptures whom we consider the saints of God, the heroes of our faith, 
experienced God's silence time and time again. It felt like God has abandoned them. It, they felt like God doesn't care for the problem. They have, they have been done in their relationship with God. Their life is now over. That's what they experienced time and time again. So how do we reconcile these two statements? God will never leave me nor forsake me versus God who remains silent. How do we marry these two lines of thought? How could we, God be so active and promise us he'll be there till the ends of the earth, but at the same time, how can we understand God's silence? So in order to understand this, let's do some analysis on silence itself. Are you with me so far? That is the serious part, so now I'll break it down into simple parts so we can get it, and then we'll tie things together. Silence. You know, the strange thing about silence it is a form of communication. Okay? Silence is a form of communication. And the irony of it all is I am talking about silence. Talk and silence don't go together. It's a paradox. You know, you can communicate. What is silence? You can communicate things without saying words. Agree, wives? Right? You can communicate things without saying anything, and you c the person on the other side can receive information without experiencing any sound waves coming from the other person's mouth. So silence is a form of communication but majority of the time during the time of silence, it is meant for the listener to decode what the speaker is saying through silence. You with me? For example, okay, let me clarify this better. This is the season where you get a lot of gifts. Imagine somebody gives you a gift like this, an ugly, I consider it to be ugly, an ugly sweater, okay? You got this ugly sweater, and you open the packet, you want to respond. That person is eagerly looking at you for a response, right? He gave you a gift after all. You can say a few things. There's a few things that can happen. You can say, wow, which means it could go either way, right? Or you can say, Thank you for your very thoughtful, okay, so that you can be done with that conversation and move on in life. Or you can say, where did you get this? Because so you're so annoyed, but you don't know how to say it. You say, where did you find this thing, right? And the listener will think, okay, he's extremely delighted to find this one, or he's extremely mad, he's left. Or the other option is, Silence. You're so amazed, your eyes are glazed over. You're almost at the point of shedding tears. But the listener is now trying to dig deep into your thoughts and try to analyze what you're communicating through that silence. You with me so far? Many times, we have all these thoughts in our mind but when it comes to those words, you're kind of limited, aren't you? You can have all these thoughts in your mind, but as soon as you put words to those thoughts, you're packaging them and they're getting, beginning to have some limitations in how you're trying to communicate. And now it's the job of the receiver to understand what you're trying to say. Words, yes, you can express yourself, but words can also limit you from expressing yourself. And during such times, silence is the best option. You see how you, the foot in the mouth syndrome, right? Where you say, oh, I wish I didn't say that, and you say, then you try to cover it up and you make a bigger mess, right? So the more you say, the more you are caught. So silence is complicated, but it is a form of communication. Imagine, 
Another example. You want to teach somebody how to ride a bicycle. You will have a seminar conducted for two hours in a classroom. You can explain the physics, the laws of inertia. You can do all the calculations and the equations on the board, and you can arti articulate it so well, define the points of center of gravity, center of mass. You can talk all about that. You can talk about velocity and acceleration. You can talk about the process of riding a bicycle in long, expressive words, and you can tend to describe it so well with your words, and yet you will fall short because that kid is staring at you and saying, are you nuts? Even if you get on a bicycle, bicycle yourself and ride the bicycle and show the kid how it's done, even then he will not get the concept. You know what I mean? So there are limitations to your communication. There are limitations to the practicality of God trying to communicate with man. That's where I'm heading here. God says in his Bible very clearly, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. There might be times in your life, at this moment, very moment, you're saying, God, explain. Explain what I'm going through right now. Communicate. And God is saying, yes, son, I want to communicate with you, but it's not like giving you a lecture about things. The things I'm doing that may not make sense, so let me be silent, but you live with that faith that I'm doing something about your life. It's not about him trying to communicate, trying to explain, trying to describe what is going, uh, what he's doing in your life at this moment. Perhaps it would not make sense. For example, when the angel came to Mary, and, oh, by the way, uh, you'll be with the child of Mary. Mary could have thought, I have two X chromosomes. Where is the Y chromosome going to come from? So she turns, turns to the angel and says, how can this be? And the angel says, the power of the Most High will come upon you. Da, 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 da. It doesn't make sense, but okay. That was Mary's reply. If God tries to explain things to you, will it make sense to us now? That would be a greater question for us to ask than try to figure out what he's up to. But meanwhile, we have to live with the assurance that he is doing something. The best way to teach how to ride a bicycle is very simple. Get the kid on that bike, run with him for a while. I mean, you, you're familiar with this process, right? You run with him for a while and let, let him go. In some clumsy way, you try to teach that kid how to ride the bicycle. Either by accident or a miracle, he will figure it out. And then if he falls, he'll turn to you and give you that look. Why did you abandon me? How, did you, how can you not teach me how to do this? And you're standing there silently watching him suffer, but you're helpless. That's exactly the situation with God. But imagine by a miraculous way, this kid begins to ride this bicycle. He'll turn around to you and give you a look. If it is this simple, why didn't you teach me this beforehand? You'd win. In both cases, you don't win. Right? The child is now figuring out, it's like, what took you so long, Dad, if it's this easy? That's what happens in our Christian life. When things don't work out and we are crashing, we're falling down, God is silent, we look to him, it's like, God, you don't care about me, you abandoned me. But when you figure it out eventually and you gain the understanding, hindsight 2020 happens, 
And you say, oh, this is why you didn't answer my prayer by giving me that woman beforehand. Oh, Lord, thank you. It turned out good. But at that moment, you were so mad at God that God didn't answer your prayer. Hence, hindsight is twenty twenty, And during this silence, you're scratching your head. But once the understanding comes, the bulb comes on, you will naturally thank God anyway because of his intricate design, his masterful weaving, the grand design of our master is at work, and his silence is not silence after all. Somebody said God's wheels turn slow, but they grind fine. God takes his time, but he does a thorough work in his children. Sometimes he feels like he's doing nothing in my life. I feel like I'm not growing. I'm not hungry for him. And it feels like my life is falling apart. And there are many seasons you go through those things, those moments of where is God at this moment. If you ask God and open the door of his mind, hypothetically speaking, and you look into his mind, the Bible says his thoughts for you are far greater than the grains of the sand. You will see, Lord, you have so many things in store for me in your head, and you're watching all these things. Oh, you have a strategy. And you shut that door with the comfort that he's doing something. God is at work, even though time and time again in the scriptures you feel that he has, is not doing anything. The Bible says he will not remain silent forever. You're praying for your children, for their salvation. It's been years. You think God is not doing anything? Just open the door of his mind and you will see. You're praying for resolution for your health, for your situations, for your circumstances, and you've been fighting for this again and again, and you're saying God is silent. Don't you for a moment, child of God, think that your God is is silent. God will not relent forever. The one who knows how to do all things will not remain silent forever. If I'm silent and I know exactly what to do and I don't communicate, doesn't, doesn't mean that I don't know what to do. I have it in my head, but in due time it will come. It's a secret and a mystery until the point where it happens. But until that moment, I have to hold on to my faith that God is at work. His silence is not silence. But meanwhile, we have to be very careful to eliminate all the noise around us. There will be good people, bad people, everybody trying to give good advice and bad advice. They don't even realize if only they follow their own advice. Everybody keeps telling you what to do at this time of crisis. Everybody has an opinion and suggestion. This is the time you try to smother those voices, and there's only one place that you can go to is the Word of God. Somebody said, don't say God has been silent if you haven't opened your Bible. True. At this time where you don't have a clear-cut answer for the decision for that moment where you don't understand, remember to open the Bible, look back into the past what God has done, and you can come away with the assurance that God is at work. You'll come away with the assurance that God still does things. And unless you open your Bible, unless you go through the basics and the fundamentals of Christianity, the strange thing is I tell a five-year-old kid to pray, and I tell an old gentleman to pray as well. Read your Bible, read your Bible. Same principle, fundamentals, consistently, you will see the difference in your life. You will not be shaken. It won't be meaningless. But it still doesn't answer the question, why does God choose to be silent? It still doesn't answer this question. How does this silence affect me? The best way to understand is this Christ's words on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they, those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. They will be filled. You know what Sermon on the Mount is all about? It's all about disqualifying people. Let me explain. Are you satisfied? Christ is saying. Then you don't need me. Only for those who hunger and thirst, I'm there. Are you full? You don't need me. Are you already comforted? Then you don't need me because I'm only there for those who mourn. Are you already rich in your spirit and you feel that you're there already and you made it? I'm sorry, I'm not for you. I'm for the poor. Basically, those who are self-sufficient, self-satisfied people, who are the masters of their own fate, Christ said, I'm not for you. I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. He was very clear about it. If we are perfect, if my children, pastor's kids, if they are perfect, they don't need Christ. So now I'm not trying to bring up perfect kids, and I'm not trying to pretend to be perfect in front of you. In my humanity, in my weaknesses, in my limitations you can see how God can be glorified that's what I'm here for the irony of it is I speak two other languages he could have easily made me something in India he made me learn English and made me a pastor to all white people who speak only English what a joke oh Lord the way he does things don't make sense but somebody said, the greatest theological statement, I think, is if the Lord needs a donkey, a donkey will do. <laughs> I'm available. God knows how to choose people so that they do not gloat about themselves. He chooses the foolish things of the world, and that's how he gets the glory. If you're not mourning, ladies and gentlemen, you will not experience the joy of the comfort of Christ if you're not hungry and thirsty, you will not know how to be satisfied in Christ. If there is no longing for God in your life, you will still uh, suffer you know, in your life with satisfaction from every other thing. But this longing makes you ask so that God would fill your emptiness. His silence is what makes you knock the doors of heaven. This silence is what brings you to his, your knees. This silence is what makes you communicate with God. Trials and tribulations and the suffering, if these are the patterns that God chooses in your life to cry out to Him, call out to Him, talk to Him. This is God's established pattern. There are no shortcuts. You want to get to heaven? I thought after I was born again, it's a ride in the clouds to heaven. I'll be like a holy saint flying into heaven for the rest of my life. I fell worse from what I was before. Then I realized, wait a minute, what, what is, things are going wrong all around me. I thought my life will be pleasurable. It will be a bed of roses when it's not. And then one day I realized Psalm 23 says, Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will not fear any evil for I am with you. So there is a valley and there's a shadow of death. It feels like death and looks like death. It's, I got to walk through that. Yes, you do. What, what, what is the greatest assurance of it all is He will walk with you. That's the promise that God gives. In this world, you may not have the answers, but He will walk with you. This is the pattern that happens when you're saved. Initially, some man of God, God called God the hound of heaven. People perishing all over, people compromised in their lifestyles. God chases them, this wicked, this restless generation, and says, I need, to, I need to show my love to you. Through his creation, through the message, he tries to chase after people, after humanity. And then the person gets saved. Salvation happens. Their eyes are open. They realize who God is. And then their life and the journey begins. The sanctification process, a big word, don't be scared of it. Sanctification is basically trying to be the true disciple of Christ, becoming like Christ. The process begins. 
Have you realized, have you forgotten when you were a new Christian, you were walking and anything to do with God was exciting, wasn't it? You prayed the prayer and God used to show up in your room. His presence is everywhere. The wind blows on your neck and say, Holy Spirit, is that you? Remember those days? But God is, seems to be everywhere at your beck and call. And you're crying out and you call out in the simplest of childlike cry and God shows up. You thought, this is exciting. This is fantastic. God is there, right there, whenever I call upon him. But slowly but surely, you see the arrow, it changes direction, ladies and gentlemen. God begins to hide. What do I mean by that? Hide for us mentally. He never leaves you, but seems like he's diminishing. And for the rest of your life, as you're growing in maturity, you begin to ask, seek, knock, God, where are you? The roles are reversed, and your satisfaction in Christian life is now defined by your pursuit of God. He's no longer chasing you, but you are chasing him because he transformed your life and made you restless. Does that equation make sense? That's why many people talk about those good old days. There's nothing good, nothing old about them. You were young. That's why God was changing your diapers and giving you the bottle every half an hour. But now that you're grown, you don't need those diapers or the bottle. You need to eat the steak. That's what God is training you for. Mmm, steak. Anybody hungry? All right. You see, God derives our lives. He wants us to be satisfied in Him, in Him alone. And this is a journey that we make. Don't you for a moment, here is my recommendation, don't you for a moment be satisfied in your Christian walk. Oh, I think I know enough of God, I'm satisfied. No, that's when you are doomed. You're either, go, either going forward or going backward on this road to Jerusalem. You don't just stay still. The process of God is a process, but He is the one who creates the desperation. He is the one who creates the hunger. And strangely enough, how does He create this hunger? Through his silence. Isn't that strange? He creates that hunger through his silence. Sometimes I don't feel like praying God. You ask God, God, I need that passion. I need that desire to be hungry after you. God says, sure. How does he do it? Silence. Strange methods don't relate the spiritual to the physical. Where you darkly, you're hungry, you want to be satisfied, and there it is, North American life. Beck and call, you're sick, you have insurance, you cut the tire is flat, you have a spare tire. Right? Everything is taken care of. But in the spiritual context, God wants you to be hungry. How will you know that God is your shelter, your refuge, your strong tower, your only hope, unless you go through a storm? How can you experience God until you experience the deprav de deprivation, adversity, scarcity, and suffering? These are the things the Bible says are the best things for you. What? These struggles are the best things for my life? Trials and tribulations are the best thing? God says yes. It produces the best character. The Bible actually warns against prosperity, ease, abundance, and they are going to produce the worst. Let me back it up with the scripture. Deuteronomy, he tells the Israelites, when you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I'm commanding you today. When does God say, don't forget? When you're satisfied and full. <laughs> okay? God warns them very carefully. When you're full and you're satisfied and you're no longer hungry, you will forget about me. And if you look at the whole history of Israel, Old Testament, it's a vicious cycle that keeps going. They're full, they're satisfied, they forget God and have these other idols and other gods. 
God sends judgment also and oh broken cries, Lord forgive us, we are hungry, we are dying. God comes through and then, oh Lord, we love you, we make a covenant with you, we'll renew our relationship with you, all that stuff happens. And again they're satisfied and they're full and again they go back into the cycle where they forget God. That's the same that happens with our life. The moment we get comfortable, the moment we are satisfied, we forget God. Strangely, that's the way it is. Do we want to go through trials and tribulations? By actually, Philippians says, rejoice greatly when you're going through all kinds of trials. Is that a call to hypocrisy? Ha ha, I am suffering. Do you say that when you walk into the church? I'm going through so many trials and I rejoice greatly. No, you don't do that. The reality is, pain is real. Suffering is real. At this moment we cry. There's one thing I tell God, Lord, in my pain, help me not to sin against you. I want to say all kinds of things to God and express myself very clearly, not in a filthy way, but in an angry way, in a frustrated way, in a desperate way. But God says, no, son, I'm at work. And that's when I try to weed through everything and try to see what is he up to. Help me to understand your ways. Help me to know your ways, God. Give me the patience. Give me the long suffering. So that boils on to the final question. What do we do when God remains silent? What do we do when God remains silent? Yes, there is a recipe for everything. Three points. Examine, remember, and wait. Let me explain this. Examine. And I choose the book of Lamentations, since we're all mourning with this silent situation. Lamentations has very good stuff related to this. Examine. The first thing we need to do, God, you are silent. Is it because of my rebellion of sorts, maybe? Is it because of my blatant disregard to your word or to your scriptures or to your Holy Spirit? The Bible says in Lamentations 3.40, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Examination is not a bad thing. We examine ourselves. Corinthians talks about it. This is biblical mandate. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God of the heavens only after we examine ourselves. What do we examine for? Not for the answer. We examine ourselves to see whether our hunger for God is still there, whether our leaning upon God is still there, whether there's conviction in our life for God and His promises still alive. When God is silent, many people go into the process of condemnation. God hates me. You saw that with King David. They're like, oh, I'm done. God is doomed. God is moving on to somebody else. That's what happens during silence. That's a bad thing. God didn't come and save you to condemn you. He came to convict you so that you might realize and examine yourself and say that he's still sovereign. My heart still longs for him. So the first step when God is silent is to examine whether you are doing the things you're supposed to that is simply believing in him. Are you still believing in him? Is your faith still not shaken? That's what you got to check. Number two, remember. It's a very powerful word in Hebrew. In Hebrew language, the word remember means let this memory shape your life. The memory that you have from the past needs to shape your life. That's what remember means in Hebrew. So Lamentations 3.21 says, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. You call to mind the goodness of God. Call to mind the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Call to mind the good thing he has done in the past. Call to mind the promises that you have because of Christ's finished work upon the cross. Call to mind the new covenant that you are his property. You got to go back and remember that this God is not going to forsake you. You got to remember how many times in your own life, God has redeemed you. That's what remember means. 
got to look back and that memory, let it dictate your present. Make sense? If you look at the Israelites, any time they were in a crisis, you know what they used to say? You read the Psalms, any time in the Old Testament, when the Israelites were in crisis, they immediately switched back to the scene of Exodus. Oh Lord, you redeemed us out of Egypt and we walked through the waters. You know how many times in crisis, when things didn't make sense now, they reverted back to that memory. And that memory gave them the strength to carry on towards tomorrow. Remember God's promises when God is silent. The third step is wait. This is the hardest part of it all. Right? In the fast food generation, everything is fast. Waiting is a hard thing to do. Lamentations 3, 24, to a few scriptures there, I'm just going to read them. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let him sit alone in silence. What is the Bible saying? If your God is silent, you be silent. That's exactly what it's saying. You be in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him, let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. For, the, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is, in our, is his unfailing love. Has God ever ripped you off? Ever cheated you? Ever deceived you? Look back into your life and see what has happened so far. Connect the dots and see the goodness of God. I try to see the goodness of God in all the areas of my life. I started in India. For example, my driving habits. I'll give you a little hint of what happened. In India, you don't drive. You point your vehicle in the direction you intend to go, and you go. Whether things are coming towards you or going away from you, you go. And if you see a cop, turn around, go the other way. There's a lot of things you do. That's my Indian driving experiences. And for my memory's sake, I don't even remember I seen a speed limit sign. I don't think I've seen it. The red light is only a suggestion. Right? So that's, that was my life. Then I came to California, highways, that's in Dallas, Texas, straight roads, amazing. And there was a guy called Noah who drove me once. He had a big truck, massive truck, and I was sitting on this corner. He was way far there. That's a huge truck. And I was looking at him. The main thing I was amazed by is I was looking at the road, and he was driving between two straight lines. I looked at him and said, how are you able to keep the vehicle in between? That was my amazement. God astonished me with man's ability, right? Then I got into the mode, and my goal has been to drive between these two straight lines. And from California, I came here, uh, then I came to Kansas, I lived there for a while, where there are two lanes, opposing traffic, no more highways, small streets, but straight roads, great. So I learned how not to panic, keep between those lines, and I came to Halifax downtown. See, God did that progressive development in my life. And I say, Lord, if you put me in Halifax downtown, from India to now, there'll be accidents all around me, but not me. <laughs> I'll be the safest guy because I'll be driving. Everybody else will be following the rules. So God took me developmentally through these stages of life, and one day I actually took time to thank God for teaching me to drive. You see, those things we do not realize. The subtle way that God intervenes in your life, now I don't know, even today, how many times he stopped a deer somewhere on the highway. I don't know. He said, oh, Kamal is coming, guys, everybody watch out. And it still happens in my life. Right? <laughs> Joanne is happy for that. Thank you, I'm still alive. <laughs> She's happy for that cause, I think. So many times during the process of waiting, 
where you're desperate to learn and see God in action, you may not. The strange thing is, he told a bunch of guys, go wait for my promise, Luke 24, stay un- uh, uh, but stay in the city until you're clothed with the power from on high. 120 people waited for 50 days to the day of Pentecost. Imagine on the 49th day, the 119th guy said, okay guys, I waited too long, I'm hungry, I'm going to leave this place. I'm tired of praying. And he left, and the Holy Spirit came. What would have happened? They waited, and the Holy Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit came. They turned the world upside down. All because they waited. The first instruction, wait. So as we wait in God's silence, this is what will happen. You become more obedient to your living God. You don't even know how God shapes you. He'll be transforming you from the inside out. You'll be deepening your insights into God's promises. You'll understand His ways better. You'll become less dependent upon the circumstances, more dependent upon His promises. And on that day, when God comes through in your life, can you imagine the joy that emanates? Can you imagine when he trades that sorrow of, of, for, uh, uh, and mourning for joy and praise? When the spirit of heaviness is lifted off your life and all of a sudden you're exploding with meaning and joy because of, God, of what God has come through, all of a sudden your life takes a different turn and no wonder your thirst and your hunger has been satisfied. You know one thing that bothers me in the scripture? When the Israelites left Egypt, they go to the other side, they cross the Red Sea, then they take out their tambourines and they start singing praise. And they sing a song as soon after after they come to the other side walking through the water. My question to us is, why did they pack tambourines? You have to leave in haste out of Egypt. It's like, okay, guys, you got to evacuate Halifax. I wouldn't be saying, okay, let me pack my teacup. There are higher things and high priority things that I need to pack. I won't go for tambourines, ladies and gentlemen. Stressful. I don't know how God is going to pull this off. Let me get this basic stuff and hopefully we can make it. No, they packed the tambourines because they were confident that they're going to the other side. And when they go to the other side, a song automatically comes. And they know they have to sing. That's what God does in our life through this silent time but make sure your tambourines are ready. Make sure, because he will come through, that rejoicing will happen. Bible says, 1 Peter 1, In this you greatly rejoice, even though uh, now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So my recommendation for us this morning, for the, through this whole sermon, is very simple. When God is silent, respond biblically, not emotionally. Respond biblically, not emotionally. This is where you're growing in maturity. Strange as it may seem, God is at work, even through His silence. Praise is on the other side. Hang in there, you almost made it. And strangely enough, out of all the books, the book of Lamentations, I never thought in my life I would find a scripture like this. And the Bible says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions. Never fail, they are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness. Can you imagine this scripture out of all the scriptures is found in the book of Lamentations? Your God is faithful, yes, and perhaps you're surrounded by the lamenting situation of God's silence. But remember, great is His faithfulness. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your silence. I don't think I ever thank you before for being silent. But this morning we take time to acknowledge the fact that you are sovereign and your silence as a great means of communication that we can't comprehend at this moment. We humbly pray 
that you'd give us this enablement to hang in there, to wait, to rejoice in expectation and hope where our faith is refined by fire, where it's going to come out worth more than gold. We thank you, Lord, for what you're capable of doing. We thank you for your love towards us is unshakable. This covenant you made is forever. And we thank you so much for what has happened because of what you've done upon the cross. And this morning, in this period of silence we're going through, we might be saying, how can this be? But yet, Lord, may it be so according to your will. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you've been blessed by today's teaching. We hope you would join us weekly in pursuing God through His Word. If you would like to learn more, please join our discipleship school. You can find us at seasidecommunity.org, YouTube, or Facebook. We always enjoy our listeners' feedback. So send your comments and prayer requests to info at seasidecommunity.org. We would love to hear from you. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always.